Hey everybody, it's AJ Heitman and I'm in uh, California and my guests today are uh, Dr. Jeff Goodlow and he's in Tulsa and we have uh, Tyler Wedman. And Tyler, you're in, uh, are you in Tulsa or Oklahoma City today? AJ, I'm in Oklahoma City today. You're in Oklahoma City. Um, by way of introduction, Dr. Goodlow is uh, uh, a professor and chief of EMS section of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Oklahoma School of uh, Community Medicine in Tulsa. Uh, he has the privilege of serving as the medical director for the medical control board in the EMS system for Metropolitan Oklahoma City and uh, Tulsa, working with a multitude of agencies, including the uh, EMS Authority, very well known as EMSA, and uh, Oklahoma City Fire Department and Tulsa Fire Department. Uh, he started in EMS in 1988, so he's a relative baby. Uh, as an EMT and uh, has never quit learning. Um, he's been a uh, member of the GENS editorial board and a uh, member of the Metropolitan Medical Directors, uh, the Eagles, AKA Eagles. Uh, Tyler is a uh, uh, nationally registered paramedic. He works for Global Medical Response in their operation in EMSA in Oklahoma City. And uh, he serves as Director of Clinical Services for EMSA in the Western Division, which is Metropolitan Oklahoma City. He oversees uh, new hire, clinical onboarding, CQI, CME, uh, and other clinical and educational duties. Um, I think we're gonna have a fun show for you. And uh, by fun, it's a very serious topic for me because it's all about ventilation. With the coronavirus going on, uh, we're seeing patients uh, left and right uh, on every shift that need uh, ventilation. Uh, patients that are coming to us pretty sick. So the need for advanced uh, ventilation has been at the forefront of the patient care during the corona, uh, uh, coronavirus para, uh, pandemic. Um, the shortage of mechanical ventilators has also surfaced as an overall shortfall in many systems. So I turn to uh, EMSA because I know for the past 10 years, you guys have been using uh, ventilators. Uh, you run an all ALS system, at least one medic and an EMT and every unit and sometimes two medics and uh, have a split almost 50-50 between Oklahoma City and Tulsa in the number of units. So there, there's 100 ventilators out there. And uh, I just want to ask you, Dr. Goodlaw, how did you get interested in mechanical ventilation 10 years ago? Yeah, well, so AJ, great to be with you. Um, I want to, uh, want to make sure that the listeners also know my most important qualification. I'm the third vice president of the AJ Heitman Fan Club Oklahoma chapter and uh, hoping to move up to the second vice president uh, as soon as possible. But, Great, I'll talk to the two other members that uh, can maybe vote you into that. Yeah, hey, thanks for having us, AJ. So uh, just wanted to uh, put a little bit of levity in there because obviously um, we're, we're talking about a very serious topic. Um, so, you know, the question about how I got interested in mechanical ventilation, um, I, I think is probably a question of, of how so much comes to be in the practice of EMS medicine. Um, sometimes there's just sheer necessity and then more and more, uh, we add this very important flavor of evidence-based medicine in there. And for me, starting in EMS, as you said, back in the late 80s, um, I really cut my teeth as an EMT and, and especially as a paramedic, being in a system where we did not have what we have in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And that is wonderful fire departments to work with, um, super engaged in the mission of EMS care for the communities. Um, I grew up in systems where it was basically me, my partner, and uh, our desire to go save the world. <laughs> and so if you, you know, and I know you've been in that kind of situation too. And so if you think about working as a young paramedic, uh, cardiac arrest cases, uh, significant respiratory distress cases, um, where these patients are intubated, uh, now, you're, now you're in the back alone, you're en route to the hospital, especially in a countywide type system. Um, yeah, you might have a five, 10 minute transport if you're lucky. Sometimes it might be 25, 30 minutes, depending on where you're coming from. And so uh, you're either trying to do some form of chest compressions, um, maybe administer some medications, squeeze the bag, phone the hospital. I mean, you know, um, probably, probably a good thing. I had an extra three or four arms back in those parts of my life, but, um, and you did so it all consistently, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. High, 
I, I'm not sure we had uh, high quality CPR. We had um, some quality CPR, right? So um, thank goodness we're doing things so much different uh, today, uh, not, not just for us and understanding uh, better standards of care, but far more importantly for, for the patients that depend on us. Um, and so, you know, I took that background and said, hey, um, we are adding more and more to the sophistication of the practice of EMS medicine. And uh, there, there really structurally is only so much uh, a single paramedic or even with an additional paramedic or two that may be riding in as we typically have. We uh, pull paramedics from our engine uh, and squad apparatus in Oklahoma City and Tulsa to ride in with this. They're just fantastic about that. Um, same from our suburban departments. We have a mix of ALS and BLS um, apparatus in, in those agencies, depending on the exact suburb. So, um, you know, the configuration can differ a little bit, but the bottom line is there is that necessity sometimes just to structurally free up a pair of hands. Um, and, and a ventilator can obviously do that in, in the right setting. You know, that's maybe part of the necessity. Um, I think the evidence-based practice of medicine it really has continued to evolve. And, you know, we got very serious about looking at ventilators over a decade ago. Um, you know, strangely enough, I wasn't even looking at the, at the mechanical ventilator part of the ventilator piece. Um, what I was really looking for at the time was something that would do bi-level positive airway pressure and continuous positive airway pressure. And very importantly, allow us to deliver an FiO2 of 100%. Now, there are certainly are a few things on the market today that will do that, but if you step back a decade ago, um, I can tell you that there were very, very few options. Uh, we actually spent over a couple of years until we got to the exact model that we still carry today. And in fact, the ventilators, um, the, the actual ventilator that Tyler is gonna do some detail work with us today on, those are the same ventilators we bought uh, nine, 10 years ago. They've really proven incredibly durable. Um, and, and very importantly, they allowed us to achieve those objectives of uh, CPAP, bi-level PAP, and mechanical ventilation all in one device. Um, we were looking to do that because, again, one of the hallmarks we think of EMS medicine, we bring the medicine to the patient both literally and figuratively. And so I didn't want three devices to do what one could do. And at the time, uh, vividly still remember this because it was quite a uh, research odyssey, a purchasing odyssey. Um, we looked at this device. We looked at another device uh, domestically here in the United States. Uh, it was really designed more for home health care, not for the mobility and the durability that we need in EMS. Um, and we tried to get inventive and even look internationally. Now, of course, there are some limits to what the FDA may or may not allow in the United States. Um, ultimately, we, we did our homework, and at the same time, we still got fortunate. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't make a really nice comment about a company at the time that we worked with, Impact Ventilators. Um, we were set to buy a model, and you're not going to find this in many companies. They actually reached back out to us and said, uh, we're happy to, you know, we're happy to sell you literally a hundred plus ventilators. Um, we're coming out with a brand new model. It's going to do everything that you want it to do at 75% of the cost of what you're ready to pay. And, uh, you know, that's, finally, integrity. that's good integrity. That's integrity. That's integrity. Um, that's exactly the kind of partner that you want in EMS medicine or any other practice of medicine. Um, somebody that, that really brings that kind of trust and, and partnership to the table. We've been very, very happy with that relationship. Um, if you look at impact ventilators today, you're not going to find that because Zoll purchased them out a few years ago. Um, but we've been very happy with the ongoing relationship. The same folks that we started working with, by and large, uh, are now working under the Zoll umbrella. And uh, it's just, it's been a good relationship for us. Um, and I think just to kind of complete that thought of some of the things we were looking for, um, the reason I wanted that FiO2 of 100%, I was seeing a lot of patients, um, <clears throat> CHFers in particular, occasionally COPDers, that um, yes, we were using this non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, but they weren't turning the corner like we wanted them to, and they were still going down the intubation pathway. We're always going to have some patients that continue to do that, 
um, but the percentages were a lot higher than I would have predicted. And so um, I, I know that there are people out there that are using CPAP just for their personal reasons, sleep apnea at night. Um, some people tolerate that really well. Others just don't like that continuous pressure flow. Um, and I've found that this bi-level positive airway pressure is a lot more comfortable for some patients. It's less claustrophobic. And so um, bringing that in was important and still keeping that FiO2 of 100% because, again, going back 10 years ago, most of the devices on the market, you had to look for it, but you could find that the FiO2 topped out somewhere between the mid-20s to 30%. It was really hard to find devices above an FiO2 at 30%. And I really thought that was part of the reason. And so um, we've had great success with this when we put this in place. Um, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit today. I think some of our journey as to how to incorporate this successfully in an EMS system. Um, nothing is easy in, in EMS or most other forms of medicine. And this is just another example of it. But once you really get the wheels going on this, um, I think having that ability to crank the FiO2 up it really has made a difference and it's kept a lot of our patients from going down the intubation and uh, some of the risk factors with that and risk factors of being on long-term mechanical ventilation. Uh, it's been a good journey for us. So, um, so you I have the capability, probably, excuse me, to, to monitor the patient and, and crank up the FiO2? Yeah, so I, I think that's been helpful too because, um, you know, using our, <clears throat> using our monitored defibrillator, um, being able to look at obviously real-time pulse ox, in tidal CO2, um, anybody we have on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or um, straight up mechanical ventilation, we're looking at that waveform capnography really closely in our system. Um, and I think that's important to look obviously at both sides of that respiratory equation, oxygenation and ventilation. But I think the nice thing about these ventilators um, for relatively small size, high durability, easy portability, um, we still get the benefit of peak airway pressure observations, uh, um, those pressure gradients in general. We just get a lot of information, literally breath by breath. And I think um, you're gonna find a large system like ours, um, 4,000 personnel overall in the EMS system for Metropolitan Oklahoma City and Tulsa, about 1,000 of those 4,000 are paramedics. You're going to find a spectrum of comfort level uh, and how in-depth uh, an individual medic may get with the device. Um, that's also important to have something that will really automatically do a lot of things for you. But then we have some particularly gifted paramedics like Tyler joining us today um, that really can get in there and make these devices more pinpoint accurate for what the patient needs. Uh, minute by minute, and uh, it just, it's just it's been great. Well, that's a good point. Tyler, how does having a ventilator impact the day-to-day -day care provided by your paramedics? Well, uh, I think uh, having a ventilator available to us, um, it, it really impacts us in a, in a number of different ways, and I think Dr. Goodlow, uh, he hit on, on a couple of those. Um, the first uh, and immediate uh, change is, is simply the logistics of caring for a patient, sometimes by yourself, that may need uh, ventilations. Um, instead of dedicating yourself to uh, squeezing that uh, BBM every uh, five to six seconds um, using uh, mechanical ventilation, you are now freed up to, um, you know, provide secondary assessments or, or um, uh, interventions that, that may not be able to be done uh, without uh, the use of a ventilator. Uh, one of the other uh, major impacts is um, so the confidence uh, that you have the proper, the proper equipment to take care of your patients, specifically those that uh, need uh, maybe the, the non-invasive positive pressure, um, and, and being able to see those patients uh, respond to that treatment uh, in, in such a positive way, typically, is, is our experience. Um, that is uh, something that, that uh, we see here in our system uh, every day as a benefit to having this equipment. Um, uh, if with the, uh, the case of, say, a, a cardiac arrest, the, I think the same could be said, um, freeing up a, a set of hands in a situation where every, every person uh, on scene uh, can provide uh, assistance in the care of that patient um, or the patient's family, for example, 
Uh, so those are those are the, the main uh, benefits, um, and uh, I, I would say, um, you know, the, the confidence that you have what you need to care for your patient. Now, explain. Are yours uh, oxygen driven, battery driven? I see that the unit is it mounted to the back of your striker stretcher. So I have it. I have it hung here uh, just uh, for demonstration purposes. But they are uh, battery driven, um, and then they have uh, high pressure oxygen. Uh, supply here plugged into the wall or to uh, a portable oxygen tank. So in the in the case of a cardiac arrest, well, let me back up first. You have it set up in like a CPAP configuration with a mask. And in the case of a cardiac arrest, are you guys using a uh, like an eye gel or are you are you going straight to intubation? No, we have uh, we have uh, we're, we're using innovation, but we also have the ability to use the eye gel if. Uh, if appropriate in the, in the situation. So in the, uh, in the, in the COVID-19 uh, era, are you like many other systems holding off a little bit on intubation or uh, what's your protocol right now? Yeah, so um, for, for patients that we suspect uh, may have a, a contagious uh, disease uh, right now, particularly, um, IGELs would be the, the preferred airway management uh, tool. Um, even those that we just don't know what the cause of their of their um, situation is uh, would be IGEL would be the preferred method. Uh, but we do have the ability to uh, endotracheal uh, innovation or perform endotracheal innovation on the folks that um, you know the typical EMS uh, calls. You know. Uh, uh, COPD patients or or uh, CHF patients, those those types of overdoses, traumas, that type of thing. So does the vent offer you any kind of extra security over putting a hand on a patient's face if they're in fact a cardiac arrest as a result of being uh, positive? Right. So we're able to ventilate those patients uh, mechanically so that we're, we're not uh, necessarily um, in close proximity to the patient's uh, face. Uh, we also, this setup here that I've got, um, I've also got a series of, of uh, inline filters attached to the uh, air inlet. I don't know if you can see that against my white shirt yeah, here. Uh, and then on the outlet on top of the, the ventilator, as well as the exhalation port on our, uh, on our circuit here as well. So it offers you a kind of degree. I, last time I've looked at myself, I can't have a six foot distance for me bag masking away from somebody. So at least in an ambulance, you can, you can do that. Uh, has your call volume increased with respect to positive patients? So uh, in respects to uh, pandemic like calls, it, we are seeing a slight increase. In general, however, our overall call, call volume has uh, somewhat decreased. Decreased. Yeah, I think I think in talking with the Eagles, that everybody's finding that a little bit. Um, so, Jeff, what's a typical experience in introducing uh, ventilators into an EMS system? What was the reaction when you first did that? Yeah, I think so. You know, um, <clears throat> change is sort of a it's a, a, a bimodal or a bi-directional reaction. Um, introduce something like this with thousands of people and I think it's also important for people to know that even, even with the majority of our EMS uh, uh, folks, our EMS clinicians as EMTs, we still instruct them on vent setup and, and the basics of vent operation um, because while that may not be fully within their scope of practice, we want everyone on scene to be comfortable what is or is not happening um, with that patient ventilator or patient non-invasive positive pressure ventilation interface. Um, we really strive to be a system where anybody on scene can throw the flag, so to speak, and say, hey, um, I think we need to check this, or I think the patient is declining, or something is just, you know, not right. Um, that becomes just as important in non-arrest situations as, as it does um, arrest. So I think uh, introducing this, you're, you're going to have early adopters. Um, anything new, especially with the evidence behind it as it's presented, um, you're going to have folks that race to that. And, and how soon can I use that? Can we use that this afternoon? Uh, love it, love it, love it. You're going to have um, probably the, the biggest peak, if you will, in the middle that um, 
they may be a little unsure, um, you know, how does this really work and why are we doing this at this time? Um, especially with a ventilator that, uh, you know, it, it, it is pretty intuitive in its setup, um, but there still is a sequence. It's not just a turn the button on and everything immediately works. So um, you're going to have some folks, understandably, a little trepidation about that. And then I think you're going to have, um, you know, some 10% or so that um, change is inherently bad until overwhelmingly proven otherwise. <laughs> uh, and and that's, that's pretty much what we saw experience-wise. You know, again, this was, this was literally a two-year journey from we need to look at something different. Um, uh, Oklahoma City and Tulsa, I'm very proud to have the great privilege of serving as the medical director here. It's um, been one of the more progressive EMS systems over the past uh, two, three decades. And certainly long before I got here, uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation was, was being used. But we needed to move beyond that earliest generation um, of CPAP for EMS. And again, this was really an opportunity for us to kind of re-engineer um, as we were moving beyond that generation of, of CPAP device, we were also moving beyond an earlier generation of um, more simplistic mechanical ventilation, let's say, for, for EMS systems. Um, so I think it's important how you roll this out. Um, one of the things that I think an EMS system today that's looking at either expanding their mechanical ventilation or especially going to mechanical ventilation, um, we have so much more science today that supports the benefits of this than we did even 10 years ago. And, um, you know, AJ, we have a lot of mutual friends. Uh, Tom Ofterheide up in um, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Keith Lurie in, um, in Minnesota, and, and so many of their research network partners uh, and, and of course, our dear friend, Paul Pepe, um, you know, all of these folks have really done uh, some, some landmark studies in the impact of ventilation on survival, um, particularly in cardiac arrest states or low flow, low perfusion states. And, um, you know, I think the three of us and, and certainly so many of our listeners today um, can easily appreciate that, that there really is such a thing as, uh, you know, too much of a good thing. Um, certainly when I started in EMS, um, you know, uh, oxygen was good, more oxygen was better. Uh, even <laughs> bag, more bag, than bag. Was absolutely bag, bag, bag. Uh, you know, how, how fast could you hyperventilate someone? Um, you know, the uh, gold medal award, if you can get uh, 3,000 mLs of air out of a 1,600 mL uh, BVM, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, how, how can you possibly get more and get it fast? And uh, I, I just remember that Tom did an amazing study um, uh, back in the uh, late 90s, I believe it is now, that, that looked at literally the effects of overventilation uh, on survival. And, and it was in a porcine model, but it really does carry over to humans. And especially, um, I think the work that Keith and others have done, uh, you know, in the, in the decade plus, uh, you know, since that time, we just absolutely know that, that the impact of overventilation works against all of the things we're trying to do in improving perfusion, improving cardiac output in these no to low flow states. And so I think, you know, today, um, uh, if somebody's watching and thinking, well, you know, why haven't we done mechanical ventilation yet? You know, we're way behind the curve. Um, I wouldn't look at it so much as, uh, well, how have we missed this boat? Hey, jump on, you know, uh, we're all constantly learning. And, and I think probably another decade from now, we're going to find different uses for mechanical ventilation and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation um, than, than we did, say, 10 years ago. But, but now is a great time um, to be getting into or expanding a mechanical ventilation program. Um, the science supports it now more than ever. Um, and one of the things, again, I really like about the, the and, and I think this just goes to how you onboard folks with the therapy, um, 
you know, we have some of the most amazing EMTs and paramedics uh, in metropolitan Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Everyone shows up wanting to make a positive difference for folks. And so when you show them how this is such an important part of their practice of EMS medicine, um, that really shifts the adoption curve, if you will, to the right where more and more people are excited about it. Um, it's absolutely important to have true champions like Tyler to help with the educational efforts and the ongoing CQI efforts um, and, and the expanding education efforts to keep folks in the flow of using these devices optimally. Um, but it's just so important. You know, I think um, of all the great literature that's been in gyms and, and many of the uh, uh, emergency medicine and resuscitation and, and cardiopulmonary journals over the years, um, we, we have studied and, and will continue to um, all of the micro details of chest compression, all of the micro details of defibrillation, the micro details of what medication to ad administer or how much or when to do it, what combo of meds. We, we just continue to dissect that in such small detail and shockingly, we really have not paid that much attention to the impact of ventilation. And like I say, I mentioned Tom's work earlier, Keith has done some good stuff with this, um, but by and large, the, the typical adult American today um, that has an in the field resuscitation or honestly in hospital resuscitation is still getting a tremendously variable ventilatory piece of that equation. Um, it really is dependent on who's squeezing the bag, uh, how frequent they're squeezing, what kind of volume they're giving. There's just so many variables there. And that's also something I really like about mechanical ventilation. It smooths that curve out. Um, it, it's not a set it and forget it kind of thing. It's, it's a set it and watch it carefully. Um, but it really has helped us to avoid overventilation of these patients. And I, I think just coming back to the science part of that and then linking that to the improved patient outcome, that is such an important part of onboarding these kind of devices. If you just say, well, this is something new, let's go do it. Um, I think if people don't really understand the depths of the, of the why, the how easily gets lost. You know, um uh, you talk about research. You guys are also using the ACDC pump, am I right? Yes, absolutely. The uh, rescue CPR system, both right. the pump and the impedance threshold device. And uh, how does that work with the ventilator? Is there, a, is there a circuit or, you know, when you're in a down compression, does the ventilator stop? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to lateral this to Tyler. I'll just tell you that uh, I think my initial impression is everything's perfect. We have no issues at all. Um, <laughs> everything is, you know, that's, uh, that's what any medical director wants to hear is uh, flawless performance, uh, no, no hiccups or uh, any kind of challenges encountered. But uh, obviously I'm saying that with jest, but I, I think Tyler can tell you best um, some of the ways that we've overcome some of those uh, interface challenges. Yeah, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, AJ, so uh, we're lucky the, vent the ventilator that we use um, for uh, mechanical ventilation has, has two different uh, delivery uh, modes. Um, the first one being assist control volume, so it will deliver a specific volume set by the user. Um, and then the one that we would use in, in a cardiac arrest setting would be the assist control pressure. And so as you were uh, uh, say your, your rescue partner is delivering a chest compression and the ventilator is simultaneously trying to deliver uh, a, a ventilation, um, it's going to meet that pressure uh, as, as the chest is compressed and stop that ventilation. And, and you're one of the systems that's really found that the, uh, AC, that the rescue CPR system is really a game changer in many cases, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. We've seen really encouraging outcomes, um, like just like mechanical ventilation, uh, even introducing a uh, manual <clears throat> chest plunger device. Uh, not, nothing is easy. <laughs> nothing is easy. Uh, when we introduce something uh, in our system, we have found over the years, it really does take about a year um, to, to see the variability curve get a lot smoother. 
And, um, you know, this is something we track. Uh, we're, we're fortunate. Uh, we, we have a full-time, um, highly experienced uh, paramedic in my office of medical oversight. Um, the, the biggest piece of that uh, individual's time is cardiac arrest analytics. And so we look at every single of our 1,500 resuscitations a year. Um, we not just look at the, we, we don't just look at those resuscitations, but we look at every single compression, every single ventilation, um, every additional aspect of therapy. And, and of course, um, the biggest variable, the one that, that we're most interested in, is outcome, but we have to look at all of those variables in that equation and correlate that with outcome. And we've been very happy with what we've seen in the last two, three years now using the um, uh, active compression, decompression form of CPR. Um, we continue to have very high neurologic functioning outcomes. Um, I think for years, the assumption was, you know, well, what? Why, why do you EMSers work all these folks that are, you know, inconveniently falling over dead in the community and hardly anybody survives. And if they do, they're in a persistent vegetative state. And, you know, we're just filling up nursing homes um, with poorly functioning adults. And, um, you know, that, that may have had some flavor of accuracy to it maybe 30 years ago in EMS, but, you know, think about what we've learned in, in the interim now. And so, um, there, there really is a higher quality, a much higher quality of resuscitation action today than, than I first learned all those years ago. And uh, not surprisingly then, there's a very different change in outcomes. Um, we have almost none of our patients going to skilled nursing facilities. Um, we have a few patients that require short-term rehab, but almost every one of our survivors is going back to the high quality of life that they had beforehand. When we look at the cerebral performance categorization scores, um, obviously we're looking for ones and twos. Uh, above that is, is, is not a good outcome in, in quality of life. And uh, I'm really proud to share with folks that may not have studied our system before, um, year after year, we are consistently in the 90% plus, often in the 95% plus, um, of, of our witnessed arrest, uh, bystander CPR, shockable rhythm on arrival, 95 plus percent of those folks are in CPC one and two categories, meaning um, they survive the event and they survive it neurologically intact. And in most cases are able to go back to the occupation and basically everything they were doing pre-arrest. Um, and, and, you know, yes, our overall resuscitation platform working carefully with our hospital systems, our emergency department colleagues, our ICU colleagues, cardiology colleagues, they all have a role in achieving those outcomes. Um, but I think important to today's talk too, the, the initiation and continued championing of including mechanical ventilation in our resuscitation platform, that really has had a positive impact. We can see that case after case after case um, it is immediately obvious to us when we're doing these cardiac arrest analytic reviews whether a patient was on a ventilator or not. Um, if, if they are, there is absolute perfection of the rhythm of ventilations that we see. Um, there's just no way that you or I, any of us as humans, could have that precision in, uh, in, in ventilation frequency. And uh, that really has helped us to avoid hyper ventilation, avoid overventilation per breath. Um, it's really made a positive impact. We're excited about it. Well, let me take you back 10 years. Uh, when you first started to implement this, what was the reaction or um, attitude of the hospitals and what's their attitude today about mechanical ventilation in the, in the EMSA rigs? Yeah, I, you know, I think um, I think it was positive then. It's even more positive now. Um, and it's just a lot of it with... Uh, with, with people becoming more and more familiar. Obviously, we have um, turnover in our EMS system. Um, it's a huge part of what Tyler helps us do is make sure that when we're onboarding new EMTs and medics, um, that we're not losing the overall high quality of EMS care that we're able to provide um, to the communities that depend on us. Uh, the hospitals have that same turnover of personnel too. So, 
Um, you know, the folks that are encountering us in the emergency department today, some of them were around 10 years ago when we introduced this. Most of them were not, just like folks on the street. You know, many of them were not there when we first brought this on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a new curve all the time. Um, but I think what's really been a difference maker, and, and I know Tyler can speak to this best, is the importance of that education platform in an EMS system, not just the initial part of new hire academies and, and, and initial um, didactics and psychomotor skills verification when you're joining in an agency, um, but I think it's the ongoing commitment to education and making sure that we're addressing patterns that may be concerning in the use or non-use um, of these ventilators. One, one of the telltale signs that something is getting off track is when you see a reduction in the use of mechanical ventilation compared to your baseline norms. Um, obviously, you got to make sure that you haven't had a, a simultaneous uh, decrease in cardiac arrest encounters or severe respiratory distress encounters. But if those numbers are holding about the same, but then you're seeing less frequency of mechanical ventilation use, um, that is definitely a sign to step in and address that in some ongoing education. It is most likely reflective of people getting, um, you know, just a little more timid in the use or a little uncertain, maybe their individual frequency of use has uh, slacked off a bit. And so now they find themselves avoiding the ventilator for concern that they're going to do something wrong with it. But uh, Tyler and his team have really helped us to, uh, to overcome some of those challenges, I think. Well, Tyler, when a, when a crew uses the, the vent and they go in the emergency department, does the ED staff switch over to their vent? Most typically, yes. If they have a ventilator right there in the room ready to go, um, they're able to uh, you know, transpose the uh, the settings that we've got on our ventilator uh, into their uh, equipment and so that there's a seamless transition of, of uh, that ventilation uh, when we transition care. Any other uh, challenges that uh, mechanical ventilation presented? Any other things that you have to put out as brush fires? Um, you know, I, I say the, the, the biggest one is, is simply um, uh, initial education. Uh, on the ventilator equipment, and, and I think that we are very lucky as a uh, as an industry to have uh, folks that are are so dedicated to um, to patient care. And, and when they understand that uh, you know this equipment is able to uh, uh, provide superior patient care and, and deliver those outcomes that we're looking for, um, you know the the uh, interest and the enthusiasm of using the equipment, learning the equipment is there. And so the, the biggest piece uh, for, for me anyway, as an educator is uh, making sure that those folks understand uh, why the equipment is important and obviously uh, the use. And we're, we're pretty lucky that the, the use of this equipment is, is pretty streamlined, pretty straightforward and easy to use. So the only disposable you have is the circuit and the tubing? Uh, that's correct, yeah, the, the mask. Uh, is the uh, the filters um, and that is the only disposable piece. And I'm assuming then that you do that. The hospital doesn't exchange those with you. That's correct. Yeah, we we uh, manage uh, you know the logistics of the uh, uh, disposable equipment. So I bet if you really factored out an ROI over your 10 years and all of the bag masks that you didn't have to buy and the comparative cost of a circuit, it would be a a good return on investment. I don't know. That's for that's maybe that's for another discussion, but. Um, quality patient care isn't always about cost. What about uh, any predictions about the future of ventilators and EMS? Dr. Goodlow and Tyler? Well, you know, I, I think we're, we're obviously going to see um, continued use, um, certainly along the lines that we have now. Um, I, I think that this is an interesting time with uh, this current viral pandemic and the, the best uh, virologists that, that I follow um, certainly have some consistency in their predictions that this, this is not going to be an over and done phenomenon in the United States or really anywhere else just within the next few weeks or even uh, you know into the summer months. This is probably something that we are going to continue to deal with 
um, for at least another 12 to 16 plus months. Um, obviously, there'll be some waxing and waning, it appears, by best predictive models. Uh, but I think one of the interesting aspects of this, no, no one would ever have wished this uh, uh, on, on any of our communities, um, uh, domestic or, or abroad. Um, but, but the wish part is out of the window. We're, we're dealing with what we have to deal with. And so let's make the very best of this. And so there's no question um, the average citizen in the United States today they have thought more about mechanical ventilators in the last month than they have any time in their life, most likely. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this. And, uh, you know, interest brings an opportunity. Um, I, I think it's important. Um, I didn't say this up front, and uh, my apology for, for uh, overlooking this. Um, I think it is important anybody listening to our conversation know, um, I certainly don't have any financial interest in, in any of the... Uh, uh, ventilators that we have in uh, Oklahoma City or Tulsa or any, uh, you know, comparative products, any of the disposable circuit pieces. Um, I, I always like to joke that I'm always looking for financial conflicts of interest, but <laughs> I have none. Um, but, you know, I think, I think there's a real opportunity, uh, obviously, in the mechanical ventilation industry. Um, there's a lot of interest in this, you know, what are these devices? What do they do for patients when, um, can we use them? When should we use them? Uh, and so I, I think we will continue to see um, some increased interest in these, um, not just in a disaster or pandemic planning, but, but just, you know, how are we using these um, day to day? I think we're also seeing um, in this same viral uh, continuum now that we really have dramatically changed our approach to the patient. Um, AJ, some of this you and I are hearing on our um, uh, Eagles uh, uh, web conferences. Uh, and of course, we're seeing this in all sorts of social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, um, just about anything imaginable. Uh, it's really an amazing time to be in clinical medicine. There was an old saying when I um, started again many, many years ago that, you know, it, it would take 17 years for a concept to go from early research to widespread standard of care in EMS um, or a medicine, you know, uh, as a whole. And I think we have absolutely shot that um, uh, dogma, you know, uh, in, in all of this. Um, I'm literally seeing massive changes in treatment approaches in 17 days, not 17 years. And, uh, you know, specifically, you know, at the, at the initiation of this in the United States, we thought it was important to aggressively get these folks on ventilators early. Um, and now we've come to a much different concept of we, we really should try to hold them off the ventilator um, at all if we can, or at least as long as we can, using high flow nasal cannula systems, um, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation where it's safe from an aerosol dispersal uh, environment, that type of thing. And of course, there's some logistical challenges in doing that in EMS, um, uh, probably a little easier achieved in the hospital setting where, you know, more and more negative pressure rooms uh, are existing today than they ever had before. Um, but I think it's an exciting future because it's an important piece, you know, uh, um, you, we put a lot of emphasis on um, uh, chest compression, the ABCs in some cases have become the CABs, um, but as it turns out that airway and breathing is still pretty darn important for patient stability and patient survival, and uh, mechanical ventilation certainly has its role there, so I think it's an exciting future. Well, and I think from what I've been following within AMT and others, it's, uh, it's also exciting because the uh, Congress now is well aware that we really don't have a lead EMS agency, that there really isn't a docket of funding, that uh, ventilators aren't available on ambulances. And uh, one of my predictions is more and more units will be uh, using ventilators and they'll probably be more fundable under federal sources in the future because if we had an overabundance of ALS units with ventilators, we could be loaning some of those ventilators to the ICUs that are in great need of them. So the ready reserve capability of having ventilators in uh, ALS units, I, I think is incredible. As we close here, I'll tell you that I was talking to a, uh, an anesthesiologist friend of mine and I said, 
isn't it really crazy that we're still bagging people? And if I had a nickel for every person who said, yeah, you have to bag, that's the way to go. You have to get lung compliance. He said, AJ, I go to work every day and I do a couple of bags. You know, I feel some lung compliance and then my patients are on a vent. And then he ended by saying, uh, you know, uh, bag masks are so 1970s. And if you think about that, even in our textbooks, bag masks are really 1970s. So uh, Jeff, I appreciate you being on with us and Tyler, uh, great. Your, your patient there has been very patient for the hour that we've been talking. So uh, give him a cookie and uh, tell him to have a great day. Uh, both of you, thanks for being on the EMS Today show and uh, please be safe out there. It's a really dangerous time as well as an exciting time in EMS. Okay, well, thank you, AJ. Appreciate you uh, allowing us an opportunity to join you at just a great, uh, privilege to uh, share some of our experience if it'll help other EMS systems and uh, you know we, we have a lot of fun with each other but in sincerity it is uh, also just a great privilege to be your friend and thank you for all that you've done and continue to do in EMS. Uh, we've talked about Jim's being the conscience of EMS for many many years but um, you've been an incredible leader and you personally are a conscience of EMS and thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you, Tyler. Um, I'm going to leave you now. I have a lot of grass to cut behind me here, and uh, I'll see you guys again. Thanks. Thanks.